Just what do you have to do when a queen decides she's going to pop in to see you, and not just any old queen? Victoria! We're chasing our longest reigning monarch around the country to the magnificent mansion she visited. We'll be delving into her personal diaries to reveal what happened behind closed doors. Today, we've come north of the border to the home of the Dukes of Roxburgh at Fleurs Castle. And we're going to be finding out what happened here during three days in 1867. And as someone who spent a lifetime getting excited by antiques, I'll be trying my luck with a Victorian fishing rod. My God, you wouldn't even need to be catching a salmon, honestly. You're taking all day to wind that in. I hope Tim gets a bite, because as a chef who's passionate about great food, I'll be in the kitchen creating a spectacular Scottish salmon dish, Victorian style. So Ooh, what if you a could, treat! And how could, extravagant! And serving it to my very own catch of the day, Tim. I think we have to raise a glass to you and your team, Resmi. There's a true sense of sadness about our visit to Fleurs today, because out of the many royal trips that we're making, this is the first official public visit that Victoria made after the death of her beloved husband, Prince Albert. And it was a whole six years since the passing of Albert, and you know, Victoria was still deeply affected by it. Albert's death in 1861 came after a long fight against typhoid. So, after years of self-imposed seclusion and obsessive mourning, Victoria's return to official duty north of the border would have been particularly emotional. But the show had to go on, and besides, Victoria had been promising a visit to the Duke and Duchess for some time. Well, she may have been without Albert, but at least she did have four of her nine children with her, because travelling with her was Helena and Louise, Beatrice and Leopold. And, you know, it's wonderful to have a large family to actually to have supported her. And also, she had ladies-in-waiting and, of course, her equerries as well. Yep. They all came up from Windsor on the train and they overnighted in Carlisle, just south of the border. Well, Tim, I'm going downstairs to see how the Duke and Duchess's staff cope with Victoria's visit. Toodaloo, Rosemary. Bye. Well, I head upstairs to investigate how Victoria got on on her first visit after the death of her beloved Albert. After her overnight stay in Carlisle, Victoria arrived by train the next morning in the local town of Kelso. And for once, the fine Victorian railway system let her down as the train rolled in more than an hour and a half late. That didn't deter her loyal public. After six years out of the spotlight, Victoria was greeted by hordes of loyal subjects, as seen in these drawings, made for the report for the Illustrated London News, the popular rag of the day. For the mournful Victoria, these scenes of loyalty must have been heartwarming. But once the Queen finally arrived here at Floors, it would appear that she's really rather impressed. She writes in her diary, the park is remarkably fine, with the approach under splendid beech, sycamore and oak trees. The house, very handsome. Built originally by John Vanbrugh in 1718, but much improved by the present Duke. He hired Edinburgh architect William Playfair, and he was determined to create a fairy tale castle on the banks of the River Tweed. He even created this grand structure at the front of the house so that carriages could drive right up to the front door without getting wet. This wonderful port cocher or carriage porch was added by Playfair, along with all these other lovely decorative little turreted pieces. <laughs> Charming. And it was Playfair himself who pronounced that these door handles were worthy of the Vatican. <laughs> Bit over the top. Morning. Playfair also rebuilt the staff quarters, which must have gone down pretty well with the royal entourage. I'm at the far end of the kitchen wing. This is the kitchen courtyard. 
this was the hub of the downstairs domain because all the servants, including Victoria's staff, would have stayed in many of the rooms dotted around this courtyard. Right up to the present day, this still serves as a home for the people who actually work here and the people who still live here, the butler, the chauffeur and the housekeeper. How lucky are they? While the staff were finding their rooms, upstairs Victoria was being greeted in the entrance hall. Having been greeted in the port cochere, the Queen was very quickly ushered into the library before being quickly taken to a private breakfast with her children. She records it was ten past twelve. Very precise. Kind of royal brunch time. This room, quite obviously now, is a billiard room. But originally, it was designed by Playfair as one of the state bedrooms. But it wasn't occupied by Victoria. She was allocated a trio of rooms upstairs. It was actually her sickly haemophiliac son, Prince Leopold, who got this state bedroom. The most appropriate picture in this room, I guess, has to be this one of the Sixth Duchess. You see her here pretty well as she would have looked when Victoria came to visit because this picture was only completed a few years afterwards. As mistress of the house, she would have been responsible for the allocation of bedrooms. And whilst Prince Leopold was down here, for Victoria, whose heart, even six years after the loss of Albert, was aching uncontrollably, had this to say from her diary. The children were close at hand, but the feeling of loneliness when I saw no room for my darling and felt I was indeed alone and a widow overcame me very sadly. It was the first time I had gone in this way on a visit and I thought so much of all dearest Albert would have done and said and how he would have wandered about everywhere, admired everything, looked at everything and now, oh, must it ever be so? Poor woman. This was Victoria's first official visit in six years, so the pressure would have been ramped up a notch for the servants downstairs, especially in the kitchen. Time to see what Victorian delicacy chef and food historian Ivan Days got up his sleeve for today's royal dinner. This is the River Tweed, mm. so really it has to be salmon. Mm. This is one of the greatest salmon rivers in Britain. And I've chosen a recipe which actually appears in two cookery books written by Victoria's chefs, and it's called Salmon à la Chambord. It's a very aristocratic, incredibly ornate dish, and is gonna take some preparation. First, we put roughly chopped onions, shallots, and carrots into the special poaching pan known as a fish kettle. Why are you putting in the vegetables now? <laughs> well, they will keep the strainer from sitting on the bottom which means that the salmon is going to be totally surrounded by water. It won't burn on the bottom. How clever is that? Now you're going to put the salmon in. Yeah, let's just gently get him over onto yes. the drain. And look, he fits perfectly. And I love the way you put a little string to keep the jaw attached so it doesn't fall off. Do yeah, that's very important because this is very much a centrepiece dish yes. and he's got to look really good. Put a little bit more wine in there, Rosemary. That's I think the, that's fine. That's the bit I like. Right, let's get this into the salmon kettle. Okay. Perfect. Right, Rosemary, could you put some salt in yeah. while I get the lid ready? Okay. Right, how long? Well, I'm going to get that up to a nice simmer and I'll probably give it 18 to 20 minutes, I think. <laughs> Oh, just look at that. What a vista. I'm on the south balcony of the castle, and in front of me is the River Tweed. This balcony was constructed so that it would get most of the sunshine during the day, and, of course, it makes a great platform to be able to see the outline 
of the Cheviot Hills and England beyond. This is rather fun, look. An engraving from the Illustrated London News showing the evening celebrations for the Queen's visit. We quite obviously got a corner of the castle here and down below the town of Kelso with their fireworks celebration look. There's quite clearly the spire of the church down there. What I like are these bonfires, six of them, lit on top of the Cheviot Hills. But actually, do the tops of the Cheviot Hills look like that in reality? I'm not entirely sure that they do, actually. Perhaps it's just a bit of artistic license, eh? Victoria was already very familiar with Scotland by the time she came to Flores in 1867. In fact, the trip was made en route to her Highland property, Balmoral, which she had bought 15 years earlier. But she still used her visit to explore the local sites. And her highlight was a day trip to the home of one of her heroes, Walter Scott, in nearby Abbotsford. One of his relatives, a Mr Hope Scott, gave her a personal tour, which she describes in her journal. They showed us his library, where we saw his manuscript of Ivanhoe and several others of his novels and poems. Then, his study, in which is a bust in bronze done from a cast taken after his death. We saw his journal, in which Mr Hope Scott asked them to write my name. This must have been a great thrill for Victoria, because she was a huge fan of Walter Scott, not surprising, given that they both did so much to popularise the Scottish landscape. While the Queen was indulging in a bit of sightseeing, back at the castle, the kitchen staff would have been preparing for dinner. Our salmon has been simmered in the kettle for 18 minutes and is now ready to decorate. I've removed the skin. Right. And what I'm doing now is I'm spreading a mixture of breadcrumbs yes. that have been cooked in fish stock. Yes. Mixed in with a little bit of pulverised whiting. And it acts as an adhesive yes. to stick on little strips of sole which have little slits cut in them with a sharp knife. And then these little tiny slithers of truffle are inserted and it flavours the sole and makes almost like a, a zebra pattern all over the salmon. And it's a technique that had a name. It was called conteased. Right, Rosemary, would you like to have a go at conteasing a sole, Philip? You then? know me, don't yeah, you, yeah, yeah, Ivan? Yeah. I yeah. would. So let's turn it around, because I have yeah. to work from the same. Well, the technique, basically, is to just cut a very thin slither like that and curl it up, OK? Right, OK. And then you can pop in a little bit of truffle just and then inside. push it down. The lengths the Victorian cooks went to are just amazing. It's far more intricate than anything you'd see today. Pop one in. There. While you're doing that, yep. I'm going to start to put some more force meat at this end. Yes. And we'll get the whole thing finished. Now, once we've got it adorned with the fillet of sole, we're going to put it very briefly into a hot oven. You right. only need minutes, really, to cook the sole, because it's as thin as anything. It's very intricate work, isn't it? Can I put it on? Try and... That's it. Make it touch the b bottom of the... It that's touch. it. I've got it at that side. Okay. That's great. Just tap it down so it sticks down perfectly. OK, so let's make sure we get it on the right way around. We've lost a little bit, but I can easily plop that in. Now, Rosemary, could you open the door for me, please? There we go. The dish goes into the oven for precisely seven minutes on a moderate heat. Just enough time to cook the thin strips of sole. The kitchen would never have had a short supply of salmon. During Victoria's visit, the River Tweed would have been brimming with them. And one chap would certainly have been swimming in this river when Victoria was here. Cool, how about this for a bit of local produce? The Tweed's record-breaking salmon caught in 1886 when it weighed in at 56 and a half pounds. I don't know about you, but I prefer mine with chips. 
We know Victoria loved to soak up the views across the River Tweed, but it must have been tinged with sadness, for she would also know that as a keen fisherman, her dear departed Albert would have been in his element here. Ah, oh, that's me, man. I've arranged to meet fishing expert Ian Gordon. They used to say that in Victoria's time that salmon was so plentiful on rivers like this that the locals would feed off it several times a week. In fact, they were fed up with well, eating salmon. Is that it's true? Actually, it's really strange because as like a farm servant at that time, they were told, it's like a contract to work, they were told that they weren't to be fed salmon more than two times a week. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh, I'm not eating my salmon. I'm not, oh, I've had no, enough no, of that yeah, salmon, silly. you know. I want beef. I, I, definitely, give me a bit of pig or something, you know. Is it just the aristocrats then oinking out these fish with, with flies and, and rods and stuff? That really is the common perception of the whole thing. In Victoria's time, all the fishing that was done on this river would have been done by invitation of people like the Sixth Duke at Roxburgh, as uh, Queen Victoria did at that time. We're going to ignore that modern rod, oh, right? Why? I rod. want to see you have a go with this Greenheart fellow, because <laughs> with this I can outfish you, yeah? Tim. There's no chance of you fishing me. I'll take that one. No, Listen, honestly, I'll take green, that. No, we're going to go down one. here and have a go. <laughs> Stop it! Stop it! Get off! Prince Albert isn't the only royal who had a passion for fly fishing. Apparently, Prince Charles also likes a cast or two. Well, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. Bring it on! Wow! Yeah. Look at the whip on that. I'm going to leave you to wind that in. You think you'll manage that? My God, you wouldn't even need to be catching a salmon, honestly. You're taking all day to wind that in. I'm being very, very gentle with this antique piece of equipment. There's no need to be too gentle with it. Yeah, well... This rod might have been all the fashion in Victoria's time, but it's brought me no luck today. Just as well Rosemary didn't rely on me catching a salmon for tea. After lunch on her first day at Floors, Victoria took a stroll in the grounds and admired the beautiful walled kitchen garden. The walls create a microclimate a good deal warmer than outside. The estate gardeners grew everything from cup flowers to Brussels sprouts. They not only looked great, but more importantly, fed the staff and guests, including Victoria. The man who looks after these gardens today is Andrew Simmons. What was the brief of a walled garden? It would have been as good as much as you could for the table. Um, and then once the table was supplied, it was the staff, because in Victorian time, there would have been such an entourage of staff following on. Um, you, you could possibly have up to a hundred staff to feed as well, living in. Um, so this is why there was such great produce being grown. The Victorians took gardening to a whole new level with the introduction of greenhouses or hothouses, where they were able to grow more exotic fruit. Some of these standing here today date from Victoria's visit. They even had central heating. But to make sure the Queen's greens were up to scratch, they had to fight off numerous pests. And they had some quite shocking methods. What sort of pesticides did the Victorians use? Because they used all sorts of things, didn't they? They used pesticides, but the trouble was the head gardener was under pressure to produce this perfect fruit and vegetables. And if he didn't, his job possibly could be in line. So he did use an awful lot of chemicals. Certainly lead, arsenic. I think there is still a recipe for making your own liquid nicotine. Um, and, and that would have been one of their favourite ones, and certainly smoking with nicotine. They used to make the concoction with liquid nicotine and soak rags, and then light it, and they smoke the greenhouses with that. The Victorian kitchen garden obviously made an impact on the Queen. She had one built at Balmoral, and her children had their own vegetable patches at Osborne House, the family's home on the Isle of Wight. There's an immense sadness that hangs over this visit. Despite Victoria's obvious love of Scotland, she cannot escape the constant feeling of loneliness. But luckily, 
she had the perfect hosts. She wrote, nobody could be kinder or more discreet or more anxious that I should be undisturbed when at home than the Duke or Duchess. In the years to come, Victoria enjoyed a close friendship with the Duchess. They often wrote to each other, and some of these letters are still on show at the castle today. But their relationship was cemented 14 years after this visit, in 1881, when she, the Duchess, was awarded the Order of Victoria and Albert. And two years later, she received the ultimate honour when appointed Mistress of the Robes to Queen Victoria, making her the senior lady in the royal household. Talking of senior ladies... Careful, Tim! Downstairs in the kitchen, our salmon a la chambord is nearing completion. The strips of sole have cooked perfectly in the oven and our dressed salmon is ready for the final assembly job. I've constructed a little cushion out of cold rice and covered it with a thin film of a herb butter. To make this, we've taken soft butter and added some green herbs. Parsley, chervil, tarragon and burnet, a lovely old-fashioned herb. Then we've added chopped gherkins, capers and garlic. Once it's spread over the rice, it will form a bed for the salmon to sit on. The most difficult thing is to get the fish off here onto the sockler, so we're going to have to do this together. If you right. could get that in front of you, Rosemary. The sockler is a little bit shorter than the salmon, so before you start taking it off, I've really got to get it in exactly the right place. So gently start okay. to move it across. Will is it coming? Got it? That's it. Perfect. So what's next? Well, we need to embellish it with the garnish. Right. Which is very complicated. OK. We start off with some quenelle. Quenelle are small fried patties made from force meat. That's ground meat or fish. In this case, we're using whiting. Amazing. When you get a Victorian dish like this, you yes. get the main dish and always you'll get a garniture. Right. And this is usually in two forms. One surrounds the dish mm -hmm. and the other one is stuck in the top of it. Right. In order to get this started, what we need are some of those truffles. Now, these are whole truffles. Ooh, so what if you a could, treat. And if how you could, extravagant. If you could just push them into the sock list slightly so they actually stand there. Yes. Like that. How and many do you want? I think a five. If you put a third one there... Now push it so it's actually sticking into it. Do you see what I into mean? Into the butter, that into the it. rice. And one more. So, there's our fifth one. And push it in hard. <laughs> OK. The next thing is crayfish. Oh, wow. We put one between... I'll bring them here. You can sit them like that with their claws. Put another one there. You're lining the crayfish up with our little Conti's to fill it, so they've got to be directly underneath okay. them. These are also quenelle mm. with a little strip of Conti's sole fillet down the middle, and these have been cooked. We put them in between the crayfish. Oh, amazing. Any one of these garnishes could have been the centre of a dish on their own. And there's more. We're going to decorate it with these beautiful silver hatelet skewers. I've got a crayfish, a mushroom, and this quenelle, which is our whiting forcemeat again, this time decorated with this little pattern made in truffles. And what we do with those is we put them right in the middle of the salmon, and then it should sit beautifully like that. So if you could do one at the other end... It's the bone. It's yeah. the bone. So yeah. I've got it. I've got okay. it. Okay. I'll put another one in. There. You'll feel the bone, but you can sort of work. You can work around the outside. You may have to come in a bit. That. And then you'll do another one and here. And you get your guy in there. Yes. And if you, that's perfect. It's so neat. This would be one dish of many. Unbelievable. It's almost immoral. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Well. It's a dish fit for Queen Victoria, I hope. Well, I hope it'll be fit enough for Tim. There's one key part of Floors that we haven't visited yet, a small corner of the gardens where the Roxburghs created something special just for the Queen to enjoy during her stay. A summer house. Victoria mentions that she walked onto the flower garden 
and took tea in a pretty little room adjoining them, which is entirely tiled. Well, this is it, her pretty little room, which Floors Castle still refer to as the Queen's House. <laughs> How great to be able to show off Rosemary's culinary skills in a place we know Victoria would have loved. Ah, oh, Rosemary. What a feast for your eyes. <laughs> Magnificent. What have you been up to then, girl? Well, it's actually some salmon, which has been put in some bouillon in a fish kettle. Then we baked it in the oven and we've put this wonderful fish decoration. This is a dish that Queen Victoria actually would have eaten. Well, I'm blown away. <laughs> <laughs> so you should be. But these little crayfish fellows mm. look colourful, don't they? They are. This is a little canal. It's gone with mushroom, canal, and they're shaped, they're steamed, and then crayfish. This is the moment I think we should have a drop of plonk, special white. Right, well, I'm going to cut um, up a fillet, and I'm just going to literally just prise mm. it off for you, like that. Yes. Now, whoopsie, that's always the dodgy bit, isn't it? That's always the dodgy bit. I mean, it's I falling off the bone, isn't well, it? Well, it's absolutely sensational, isn't it? Yeah. Hmm. That's superb, isn't it? It just oozes with bouillon. <laughs> I think we have to raise a glass to you and your team, Rosemary. Well, absolutely. Mm. Mm. Now, this is all very special, and I'm going to do a little show and tell for you, because I'd like to present you with the Basket Award. This is um, a little special something. It looks like something that came with little Bo Peep, doesn't it? Actually, if I take the cover off, I'll show you a little piece of paper inside. And the piece of paper says, Basket given by the Queen to the Duchess of Roxburgh, straw plaid by Her Majesty. So. Queen Victoria actually wove this exquisite straw exterior, the construction of the basket. Look she, at how clever that is. She actually did the basket itself. Yeah. You'd think she'd go out and buy a basket, wouldn't you? And simply maybe make up the silk to go in it. But she actually wove the basket herself and then gave it to her mate, the Duchess of Roxburgh. Inside, we've got a little bracelet. What do you think about that? Oh, it's adorable. And it contains a portrait of the Queen. And it was, again, presented to the Duchess of Roxburgh. And if I'm very careful and press in these little lugs like that, we take the actual portrait of Her Majesty out, and on the back of it, on the gold, it is inscribed to the Duchess of Roxburgh from her affectionate and unhappy friend, Victoria. Even in a gorgeous gift like this, she has to make reference to her unhappiness at the fact that she's a widow. And she was still in love with Albert. I think that is a lovely gift. But obviously, they gave her a lovely time here. You know what, Tim? What? I think we have had a wonderful time here. It has been a brilliant day. What a joy to come here. A joy to behold. Tis. Like you. Our next stop on Victoria's tour of Britain takes us to Hewenden Manor in Buckinghamshire, home to the Prime Minister, Benjamin Disraeli. This was not a social call. Britain was on the verge of war, and we'll be looking at some fascinating documents that reveal how Victoria was right in the thick of it. <laughs> 